One of the purposes of the meditation is to get to see what the mind is doing. Because what the mind is doing can either create happiness or it can create suffering. In fact, as the Buddha pointed out, that's the big problem in life, the fact that the mind usually acts for the purpose of creating happiness, but it ends up creating just the opposite. And you want to know why. So you don't have to do that anymore. So to watch the mind in action, we have to get at least part of it still. That's why we're focusing on the breath. We're trying to figure out what way of breathing feels best right now, long or short, fast or slow, heavy or light, deep or shallow. Which parts of the body feel best breathing? Which parts should be relaxed and not have to do any work in the breathing? There are lots of things you can explore here. But it's all for the purpose of getting the mind to settle down. Once you've found something that's comfortable, you stick with it. And as long as it stays comfortable, you don't have to do any more evaluation. Just be with the sensation of the breath. So you can get the mind to settle down, because it's only when it's settled down that you can watch its movements. This is the Buddha's main interest in having us meditate. We're not here to see what the mind is, we're here to see what it's doing. Because if you start thinking about is, you start getting involved in definitions and or so, all sorts of philosophical issues which tend to elaborate and go very far away. It's called objectification, and the Buddha said you want to avoid this, trying to figure out what kind of object the mind is, or what kind of object other people are, or what kind of object the world is. Those kinds of thoughts, the Buddha said, just turn around and attack you, and they don't lead to the end of suffering. If you want to get to the end of suffering, you have to watch what the mind is doing, because that is something that's happening right before your very eyes. In fact, it's closer than your eyes, and yet we don't see it. Our focus is out someplace else. It's like the lens of a camera whose focal point is way far away. You want to bring it in, bring it in, bring it in until the focal point is actually inside the lens. You can watch what the mind is doing. Because all that we know about ourselves and the world comes through our actions. In fact, our sense of self is something that's built around our actions. There's a desire. Then there's the question of what do you have under your control that you can actually manipulate or work with, so you can bring about that desire. And then who's going to be experiencing the results of that action? That's how we get the idea of the self as the agent, and then the self as the experiencer. Or you can think of it as self as producer and the self as the consumer of happiness. It's all around action. We have lots of selves because we've had many different desires. If you were to take them out and line them all up, you'd have a really long line. And some of those selves are pretty uncomplicated. In other words, the ones that are associated with desires that involve doing things you like to do, and you get good results. And as for the ones that were around doing things that you didn't like to do and gave bad results. In other words, uh, sort of the prototype selves that just didn't work out at all. Those just get thrown away. The difficult ones are the ones that come around actions that you like to do and give bad results, or the ones that you don't like to do but give good results. Those are the difficult selves. They can be very insistent, especially the ones that 
involve doing things you like to do but give bad results. They can give all kinds of excuses for why it didn't work out that first time. But if you try it again, it's going to work out this time. They're the ones that deal in a lot of denial. Those are probably the trickiest ones of all. Those are the ones that involve doing things you don't like to do but give good results. They can cut, sometimes get pretty irritating, too. But you have to learn how to make them more attractive. And make them more skillful. Give them more strategies. So you actually can get yourself to do the things that you don't like to do, but you know deep down inside will lead to good results in the future. So you've got all kinds of selves in here. And again, when the Buddha is talking about self, he's not talking about so, so much about an abstract idea, or saying, well, a self has to be permanent in order to qualify as a self, or that you have ultimate selves or, conditional, or conventional selves. It says the issue of self comes up around the issue of control. What kind of things can you control and what kind of things can you not? And you find there are some things that you have some amount of control over, and that's where you want to focus your, your energies. As for the things where you realize there's no control, just let those go. And of course, the question of control has a lot to do with your question of skill. This is why the Buddha focuses so much attention on the issue of skillful and unskillful action. He wants you to explore how much control you'd actually have. He doesn't tell you at the very beginning, well, just give up. We know that. Ultimately, you can't control your body because someday it's going to die against your wishes and it gets sick against your wishes. So just give up. He doesn't say that. The same with feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. He doesn't tell you just to give up. You say, well, that's not myself, so I'll just learn how to accept things as they are. That short circuits the whole path. You never get anywhere. He says, try turning these things into a state of stillness, a state of well-being. This is what concentration practice, mindfulness practice are all about. You've got the form of the breath, which shapes your sense of the body. You've got the feelings that go with the breath, and we're trying to give rise to, to comfortable ones. How much can you play with the breath? How much influence do you have on the breath? How much does the breath lie under your control? In the beginning, it seems pretty sloppy, but as you get more and more used to it, you find that you actually can get more skillful in not being a control freak, but having some control over things. you got the right perception of the breath, thinking of the breath filling the whole body. So it becomes more subtle, and it can give rise to pleasant sensations anywhere in the body. You think about the breath, you're aware of all of this. You're taking these five aggregates and you're turning them into something good, and something skillful. You're getting more control over them. And so it's inevitable that there will be a certain sense of self that develops around this, but it's a healthy one. It's a self that's willing to learn, a self that's devoted to looking for a happiness that doesn't cause any harm to anyone. And as you work with the breath, you'll get a better and better sense of how much control you actually do have in the present moment. Sometimes there are influences coming in from past actions that are really hard to overcome. And sometimes they seem hard to overcome, but they actually aren't. Now you're going to know which is which by experimenting, by exploring the extent to which you actually can make a difference through your present actions. So this is where the issue of control comes down. This the question of how much freedom of choice do you have in the present moment. And you expand your understanding, you expand your sensitivity to that by trying to be as skillful as possible. Because it's through 
your exploration of the freedom you have here, the extent to which you have some control. That's how you got to the opening of ultimate freedom. The freedom of something is totally unconditioned. And at that point, the question of control or lack of control becomes irrelevant. Because that kind of freedom, that kind of happiness that comes with the freedom, doesn't have to be protected, doesn't have to be strategized, it's just there. This is why. Well, the Forest of John said that when you actually get there, the question of self and not self becomes irrelevant, because self and not self is defined around control. And here, control, the issue of control or no control becomes irrelevant. So this is why the Buddha focused so much attention on action. Because it's through looking at your own actions and getting a sense of what their range of power is, that you can find the ultimate happiness. I was reading a book recently about someone who was looking at the Buddha's teachings mainly as a reaction to the metaphysical theories of his day, and he came up with a new metaphysical theory that everything was process. Nothing had any substance or eternal substance. As if we're just a question of, well, he didn't like their idea, so here's a new idea. Kind of tossing something out. But the Buddha was not irresponsible that way. The way he taught things was because he was very strategic. He had seen what worked in gaining true freedom for himself, and he advised that we follow the same way think in the same way. That's why we have right view as part of the path. We're not just going through a mechanical operation here. He says, look at things as processes, look at things as actions, cause and effect, because that opens things up in the mind. This way of looking has a really pragmatic value. So you look at the issues of action, cause and effect, control, lack of control. And what you can learn by watching all of this right here in the present moment. Which is why the Buddha put so much emphasis on what you do and told you to put aside for the time being the question of what you are or what the world is. Those questions of is and are, and these forms of objectification. Just get in the way. Whereas questions of what are you doing give focus and direction to the path. Get you to a point where there's nothing in the way at all.